And welcome to our digital discussion for this evening uh, to, uh, in coordination with our new exhibit, Milwaukee, Where the Waters Meet. We've got a great talk with Mark Keene about lighthouses throughout history and then through Great Lakes history in Wisconsin um, that uh, we can't wait for you to see tonight. Um, we do have another interesting program along our water theme coming up next week. Uh, you can see there the For Love of, for the love of Water. Uh, we're getting close to Valentine's Day. So, uh, but we're going to talk about water conservation in uh, Wisconsin and Milwaukee with three experts who are uh, doing it every day. So we hope you can join us for that next week, February 11th, same time, same place. If you're here, you can be there too. Uh, Tonight, though, uh, we have uh, Mark Keene. Um, he will be happy to answer any questions at the end of tonight's program. Uh, so if you have any, put them right in the comments, and we'll get to them then. Um, so without uh, any further ado, let's bring Mark in here uh, for Lighthouses, Beacons of History. Mark, take it away. Thank you, John, uh, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm very uh, excited to be on this uh program with the with Milwaukee County Historical Society. And uh, and as John mentioned about the new exhibit they have, uh, they saw it a couple of weeks ago and it's or well, a little over a week ago and it's just wonderful. So if you get a chance to uh, stop down and, and see it. So um, lighthouses uh, play a very important part of uh, navigation and, and Wisconsin history. Uh, but before I get into uh, the, the lighthouses of Wisconsin and Milwaukee, just want to give you a couple little quick facts here. The first known lighthouse in the world was the Pharos of Alexandria, Egypt. It was constructed about 300 BC. So they had lighthouses back in those days, but it, they weren't. They were lit with giant bonfires uh, that burned out and so the, the, uh, they could see them out, out into the sea. The oldest existing lighthouse in the world is considered to be La Coruna. It's in Spain, and that dates from about 20 BC. So it's still an existing lighthouse, which is kind of cool. I've, I've seen pictures of it, and I've seen talked to people that have visited it, and they said it's it's just beautiful. Uh, the first lighthouse in America was near Boston on Little Brewster Island, and it was built in 1716 um, during the Revolutionary War. The British um, uh, were coming over, and the uh, Americans uh, the, uh, were uh, didn't didn't want them to find out where to land their ships, so they 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 would uh, dismantle or or destroy the lighthouses, so the British ships uh, couldn't would run aground, and um, so it was sort of a back and forth with lighthouses after the Revolutionary War. The oldest operating lighthouse in America is it's at Sandy Hook, New Jersey. It was built in 1764, and it is still operating. So again, lighthouses play a very important part in, in history. Um, as we get towards, well, Wisconsin, um, the first lighthouse in Wisconsin was built in 1837, and uh, it's located, uh, it's the Potawatomi Lighthouse, and it's located on Rock Island up in Door County. Um, it is not a working lighthouse anymore, but there is a beacon uh, that the Coast Guard installed next to it. Um, if you ever get a chance to go up to Rock Island, you have to go up Door County to Washington Island, take the ferry across to uh, Washington Island, then take drive across Washington Island and take another small ferry over to Rock Island. And then you have about a two mile hike to the north end of the island to where the lighthouse is. Now they just restored it to its 1912 appearance with all period furniture in it. and. I was fortunate to stay a, a week up there as a guest docent a couple summers ago um, and give tours. Uh, but it's just a wonderful uh, example of, of the early lighthouse, well, the first lighthouse in Wisconsin. Milwaukee's first lighthouse was built in 1838, and it was located at the end of what is now Wisconsin Avenue. It was originally called Spring Street. Um, why Milwaukee? Um, well, Milwaukee was a, a unique location for um, navigation and ships because it had three rivers running into it, the Milwaukee, the Kinnikinnick, and the Menominee River. Now, the Milwaukee River at one point had a, a draft about, the entrance had about a draft about 18 feet, so uh, sh large ships could get up into the, the Milwaukee River, um, and then they could navigate up through the Milwaukee River and then the Menominee and the Kinnikinnick. Um, so... It was a unique place uh, 
Milwaukee also has uh, the largest uh, protected bay on, on the west side of Lake Michigan. It's three miles deep and about seven miles across. So it was a, a, a nice place to have uh, the ships could come into like a safe harbor. Uh, back in 18, well, the, the first lighthouse again was built in 1838. Um, back in 1838, the population of Milwaukee was about a thousand European Americans and the rest were the uh, native tribes, uh, which were in the area of the Potawatomi, the, the Menominee, the, the Ho-Chunk, the Ojibwa. Um, but uh, they were being forced out of their land uh, with the influx of Yankees coming from uh, the East Coast. Now, um, Solomon Juno was one of the first settlers here and he came here about 1818. He was followed by George Walker in 1834 and Byron Kilburn in 1837. And the Irish and German immigrants had completed the Erie Canal in 1825, which allowed travel from New York to Milwaukee. So it was, it opened up the whole mid, the Midwest of, of this country. Uh, so people started coming in here by ships. Before that, it was very hard to get across here by wagon or horse. So as the population of Milwaukee grew, uh, Obviously, there was it grew because of all the industry and and farming that was going on uh, on the western side of Wisconsin around La Crosse. You had a lot of lead mines. Now, lead was very important to have. Uh, a lot of people it was lead pipes. They used it for ammunition. They used it for a lot of things, uh, and uh, so that they were mining the lead in on the Mississippi in Wisconsin and taking it back east, and then putting it on ships. And, and taking it back back over to the East Coast. So, um, and then as the, over the next, as the population grew uh, by 1846, you had a population of oh, almost 25,000. They added, you know, there was breweries, meatpacking plants, tanneries, hotels, schools, banks, shipbuilding. Uh, Wisconsin or Milwaukee was one of the largest shipbuilders on the Great Lakes for several years. Um, so you had a lot of ships being built here and, and commercing in and out. Um, you know, people came in and goods went out. And uh, so Milwaukee became like, Milwaukee is still the largest port on the Great Lakes. It's larger than Chicago. Um, so shipping was critical to the growth and the original lighthouse location, uh, for having a lighthouse. By that time, people needed navigation aids. So they decided to build the lighthouse and they built it again, like I said, at the end of what is now Wisconsin Avenue. And it was built uh, with, with what they called rubble, was a was stones and things like that, different shapes, size stones. And it had a cast iron lantern room on the top of it. Um, the first lantern room that they had was being shipped from out east. It got as far as uh, around Mackinac Island and the ship sank and they lost the first uh, lantern room. So they had to get another one. But when they got it assembled, um, it wasn't very tall. Um, it was probably about 28 feet tall. Uh, and it was lit with seven Lewis lamps. Now a Lewis lamp was similar to a lantern. They had a parabolic reflector behind it. Now they had to light seven of those things that have some kind of form of light. Now the light didn't go very far out in the lake, but it was at least some gave some navigation aid to the ships. The first lighthouse keeper was a gentleman by the name of Eli Bates. Now Eli Bates uh, came from out east. He was a school teacher was one of our first public school teachers in Milwaukee. He taught at a schoolhouse located around what is now Cathedral Square. Uh, Mr. Bates was quite an interesting character. He, um, he, had, a, he, had, a, he had a cork leg, a cork, uh, his leg was a, his prosthesis was made out of cork. He lost it as a child um, and uh, he was orphaned uh, as a child. His father was a nail maker and he came from a family of 14 people. So I imagine in those days, they probably couldn't afford to take care of a, a sickly child or a, a crippled child, so they they orphaned him. But he he got himself uh, a job as a school teacher. Came out to Milwaukee, and he also became our first lighthouse keeper. Um, Mr. Bates uh, was known to have a lot of what they called smoking, gambling, and drinking sessions at the old lighthouse. Um, and they used to say that the light was the only thing that was lit at night, <laughs> but. Um, he, uh, he lasted a few years uh, in the lighthouse business, and we don't know if he really was let go or if he decided to quit, but he did leave and went down to Chicago when he got into the lumber business. And he became what we consider a millionaire in today's economy. 
Um, he is responsible for the statue of uh, the uh, Storks Fountain in Chicago and the statue of Abraham Lincoln. He was very philanthropic, uh, lived qu quite old. And uh, so he was kind of entrepreneurial. In fact, when he had the lighthouse in Milwaukee, he would uh, sell gingerbread and beer from the lighthouse keeping quarters. So again, he was pretty thrifty and, and always was looking for to make the next buck, I guess. Now the problem with the lighthouse uh, that was located downtown was it was built in the wrong spot. Um, the um, uh, the um, I'm going to skip up, up up here. The lighthouse inspector in 1838's quote was: "The site must have been chosen by someone acquainted with with little acquainted with navigation. This site is about the worst that could have been chosen." Um, so uh, the um, the uh, they I think they built it more for oh let's have a cute little lighthouse right in the center of town so everybody to look at more for aesthetics than for practicality. So they decided that you know the ships coming from the north couldn't see it because the Bay of Milwaukee is so large. As you came down the lake, the, the lighthouse was tucked in so far. Uh, you know, and I think if you go down to the lake today, you can, if you stood where that orange sunburst sculpture is, that's where the lighthouse stood. You, you can notice that you can't really see very far up, up the lake. So they decided to, to move the lighthouse. Um, I'm going to back up here a little bit. Um, uh, talk a little about the, the immigrants. Um, Milwaukee, as, as most of you probably know, is, is a melting pot for a lot of immigrants back when Milwaukee and Wisconsin was in its infancy. 48% um, of Milwaukee's residents uh, have, are claimed to have German heritage, uh, me being one of them. My great-great-grandfather came here from Stettin, Germany or Prussia in 1864. He was a shoemaker. And um, uh, one of the reasons he came here was because uh, of the leather business. Milwaukee was one of the largest manufacturers and exporters of leather goods in the world. Uh, we had all the meatpacking plants, hence we had the hides from the uh, cows, uh, and we also had the tannin uh, bark. We had the hemlock trees here in the area, so the tannin, the bark from hemlock trees is, is, is what made the tannin for the le leather, hence tanning leather. So you had a lot of uh, immigrants coming in here. Uh, Milwaukee had a lot of boot and shoe manufacturers. They had a lot of saddle manufacturers, harness manufacturers. Um, Milwaukee was also one of the largest exporters of wheat in the world for almost 48 years. Um, so you had a lot of strife going on in, in Europe at that time, back in the 18, uh, early 1840s. Um, you had religious persecution. You had a lot of wars. Uh, the Germans were being inscripted into the military. Um, you couldn't own any land. Um, so you had to, you know, find your way out of there. Again, my grand, my great, great grandfather was uh, a, uh, basically what they'd call an indentured servant. Uh, he worked for a principality in Germany. And so he bought himself out of that principality, he came here with his wife and uh, four boys. Um, the uh, Milwaukee for a long time was, was known as the Athens of the German Athens of America. Um, they used to have signs in the windows that said English spoken here, not German spoken here. Uh, so Milwaukee's German uh, heritage really, really thrived. Uh, they, in fact, they outnumbered the Yankees after a point. The natives of Ireland uh, were here and today the second, they're the second largest group behind the, the Germans. Uh, they're, they're, again, they came from a lot of poverty in, in Europe and, and the, the potato famine. Uh, there was also potato famine going on in, in Germany at the time. So rather than feed these people, they would uh, give them one-way tickets to America and, uh, and let, let, let them figure out, you know, their fate after they got them on a ship. Um, the Norwegian immigrants uh, settled in Walker's Point, uh, where they were basically shipbuilders, seamen, and captains on the waterfront. So they were pretty much involved with a lot of the shipbuilding in the uh, in Milwaukee area. The uh, African-American community, uh, which flourished in the Bronzeville section of Milwaukee, dates back to the earliest years of Milwaukee. Um, again, Yankees from New York and, and New England uh, exerted an influence beyond their numbers in a community where six out of every 10 people were born in another country. So uh, Milwaukee became quite a, 
a melting pot. Uh, Jones Island, uh, the I don't know if you folks have ever heard of the Kashubs. Uh, they were uh, from the Baltic region of the uh, of the Baltic Sea, up around Stettin, where my ancestors came from. Uh, they were pretty much a downtrodden uh, group of people that were they were referred to almost as gypsies in Europe. So they were pretty much forced out of Europe. Uh, they came here to America, and a large uh, settlement moved to Milwaukee, and they moved on to what was now Jones Island. Jones Island was originally uh, uh, a shipyard owned by uh, Monroe uh, Jones, Samuel Jones, um, and but the light that the island was very sh uh, shallow and marshy, so his shipyard kept getting washed away. So he ended up moving it across the, the river to the Walker's Point area, but the Kashubs. Um, were squatters. They came here and they just started settling on Jones Island and uh, they were the fisher folk. Um, they're the ones that are responsible for why Milwaukee has fish fries today. Uh, they were Polish Catholics and uh, as some of you Catholics know uh, that you didn't eat meat on Friday so they had fish fries and they had these taverns on the island and uh, they uh, would uh, people would row over from Bayview and St. Francis over on Friday nights for fish fries. And, and I think so today we can, we can thank the Kashubs for uh, the fish fries, but they eventually got pushed off the Island uh, by uh, a uh, iron company. Uh, again, they didn't have any, they didn't have any land. They didn't own any land. So they were pretty much forced off. There was a small park on Jones Island called Kashu Park. It has one picnic table and a tree and it's a county park. And uh, the Kashubs have an annual picnic there every year. And uh, they have to have a picnic every there every year. Otherwise, the county will take away the park. So if you ever get a chance to go visit the Kishubes uh, on their on their picnic day. Uh, the Italians moved to the Third Ward and the Greeks who settled both the east and west river. Um, a lot of the reason you came here a lot of when you got here to Milwaukee, uh, being from any country, Germany, Poland, uh Italy, uh, the first thing you did was look for your church. Uh, they spoke your language. They prepared the same kind of food. They helped you find jobs. Uh, if you look around Milwaukee today, you see all the church steeples. Milwaukee has more church steeples per square mile than any other city in the country. So again, we are a melting pot and hence that we have uh, Summerfest and, and Italian Fest and German Fest and Polish Fest and Festa Mexicana. So uh, it's, it's really nice to get, we, we're really involved with our heritage. Um, so back to the lighthouses. So in 18, 1855, 1854, they decided to, the Mariners were complaining enough that they said that, you know, we have to, we have to move the lighthouse. So in 1854, they came up to North Point. Now, North Point is the, the northest, most, northernmost point of the Bay of Milwaukee. Uh, and they purchased uh, a few, two acres of land uh, from a guy by the name of Henry Bonesteel for $1,000. And this picture right here you see is, is, the, um, is the actual, is the plot of land. And you can see where it says lighthouse right here. And that's the little strip of land that they owned, they bought from, from, Mr., from Henry. Um, it was um, the first lighthouse was made out of Cream City brick. And uh, when I would give tours at the lighthouse, a lot of people from out of state didn't know what Cream City brick was. They thought it was, it was, it was not, I would tell them it's not named after the cream from the cows. Um, it's named after the color of the brick. The Burnham Brothers uh, of Milwaukee, of which Burnham Street is named after, were the largest manufacturers of Cream City bricks in the world. Um, and if you go to Hamburg, Germany, Hamburg, Germany, uh, a lot of the buildings in Hamburg, Germany are made with Milwaukee Cream City bricks. And uh, you can see a lot today, a lot of the churches and schools in the area uh, are made out of Cream City brick. They're all kind of black now from the soot. But um, so this first lighthouse was built out of Cream City brick and it had a cast iron lantern room on it. Uh, the first lens in there was a, was a fourth order lens. Um, the lighthouse from 1836, was lit with whale oil. Uh, the lighthouse here, uh, the first lighthouse at North Point was lit with whale oil. And then um, it, it had the one, the fourth order Fresnel lens. Um, but it, it, it was about 150 feet east of the site of where it is today. Uh, so if you go, if you go to Lake Park, uh, 
walk across the Lion Bridge to your north, the north end. When you walk across the bridge, look to your right. It's kind of across from the statue of General Wolcott. There's a kind of a grass area. There's um, that's where the footprint of the original lighthouse is. And uh, the the North Point Lighthouse uh, is planning on working with uh, UWM this summer uh, with their arch arch archaeological uh, students. Uh, and they're going to try to um, do some research and do a dig out there to find the, the original lighthouse foundation and and which I think would be a really great thing to, for people to see. So uh, keep keep uh, keep your eyes open for when that might happen this summer. It's supposed to happen in sometime in July. Um, so after about 35 years, that lighthouse um, was starting to uh, fall into the lake. Uh, again, there's another lighthouse that was built in the wrong spot, sort of. It was built too close to the bluff. And uh, by the 1880s, the bluff had eroded to the lighthouse was about 10 feet from falling over the bluff. So it was only a couple storms away from toppling into the lake. So in 1888, they decided to uh, find a new spot for the lighthouse, but um, they decided to move it inland. Uh, they were going to move it to another location in the city or north, but uh, the Mariners insisted that it stay at North Point. So in 1888, they built a bolted cast iron lighthouse and they had a two, a two fan, well, it was a two story um, keeper's quarters in it. And it, again, they used the the um, the lantern room from the 1855 house. They moved it to the site of where um, uh, the new one is. Uh, the old one survived for 12,000 12, nights of service. And that's uh, what the old one looked like. Again, there's the Cream City brick and you can see the lantern room up here uh, on the corner, it was cast iron lantern room. Uh, we did uh, find, when we did some initial uh, discovery at the old site, we did find uh, where the well was, and we also found where the outhouse was, which is, you can see right here, there's a little indention in the ground, so uh, it's kind of funny, we found the light, the, 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 we found the uh, outhouse and the pump house, or the pump. Again, here's what it looked like when it's got too close to the edge. Uh, again, there was a lot of erosion. Now today, a lot of the trees have helped stop that erosion, but you can see where the, the dunes and how close it got to the uh, the bluff. And at this in this photograph, you can see that the uh, lantern room had been removed already. This area down here were piers. Now the ships would be, the lighthouses were supplied by lighthouse tenders, and uh, they would bring the supplies for the lighthouse up up on these, to these piers, and then they would walk it up the, up the um, up the hill. So 1888, this is what the, the lighthouse looked like. Again, it was made out of bolted cast iron. And the lantern room you can see was from the 18, uh, 1855 house. This was like what they call a Victorian style frame house. Um, it was, um, it was about 102 feet uh, off the, off the, off the lake up from the lake, so it had a great uh, a view, a nice view. Again, this is before anything was put out here. Uh, you can see in this drawing here, this architectural rending, uh, it had a spiral staircase in it. Um, and, and these little, I mean, you can notice these little, um, there's shades on the on the windows. Well, that was to keep the uh, lens, the lens acted as a giant magnifying glass. So in the, in the daylight, in the, in the, when the sun was out, it could actually start a fire and melt melt the apparatus, so they kept it uh, covered during the day. And later years, when the when the houses started being built in the neighborhood, they would keep the west side of the lighthouse covered, so the light wouldn't go through your bedroom window every thirty seconds. Um, let me go back here. Uh, this lighthouse was lit with uh, a the fifth or a fifth order, a fourth order. I'm sorry, fourth order Fresnel lens. Uh, the Fresnel lens uh, had a had a, a focal plane of of about uh, the beam would travel out about 21 miles. Now, uh, most of your lighthouses on the lake are are within 21 miles or less of each other, uh, and as the beam went out, it would rotate. Uh, 
and and all the beams of the lighthouses would overlap. So as you came down the lake, you'd never lose sight of a, of a lighthouse. Uh, so North Point, uh, its light again was a fourth order Fresnel lens. It was originally lit with mineral oil. Um, when it was first lit, it was lit, first built, it was lit with mineral oil, converted to coal gas in 1912 and electrified in 19, 1929. Um, so the keeper would have to, uh, every night at around dusk, there was a small oil house off to the, off to the uh, west of the house. The keeper would have to go out, collect the oil, bring it in, take it in up to the, uh, they would measure it in a drip pan and put it in a vessel and take the lantern, the lamp, uh, up to the top of the tower and place it inside of the of the lens. And that's what illuminated the light. Again, that light would shine for 21 miles, uh, one of those out in the lake. Now, well, let's say you're on a ship at night and you see a lighthouse and then you see another one and you see another one. Well, you don't know where you are. So each lighthouse has what's called a characteristic or a flash time. Light, North Point Lighthouse light flashed every 30 seconds. What I mean by flash means it rotated every 30 seconds. There was a, what they call a bullseye a lens in the center it was kind of was a round bullseye. And that's where the beam would be directed to and shine out into the lake. So the Mariners knew that North Point flashed every 30 seconds. They time it. And that's how they knew where they were. Now, during the day, same thing. Now, not so much on the Great Lakes, but on the ocean, if you notice, you'll see lighthouses that are painted red or some are painted black and white, there's stripes on them. Uh, some are painted with red stripes. Uh, those are called day markers. And it's the, it's the same process as if you were out on a lake or on the ocean, you looked out and you saw a lighthouse. Again, you could identify it on your chart as, okay, that lighthouse, that must be Sandy Hook because it's got this stripe on it. So again, that's how they navigated during the day. The first keeper at North Point Lighthouse was a woman by the name of Georgia Stebbins. Now, she's just an incredible woman. Uh, what, what she did for uh, North Point. Georgia uh, was born in New York and uh, she in 18, uh, she was born in 1846. Uh, but her father was the keeper at the uh, first lighthouse on North Point. Uh, his name was Daniel Kellogg Green. Uh, Daniel Kellogg Green was came to uh, Wisconsin in 1850. Uh, he was a farmer out in Waukesha. And then he eventually worked his way to Milwaukee. He was a bookkeeper in downtown Milwaukee. And then he finally became a, a lighthouse keeper at the age of 66 years old. Uh, Georgia stayed in New York when he moved out here in 1850s. Uh, but in 1873, she was diagnosed with what they called the consumption or tuberculosis. And in those days, they thought uh, their only chance for recovery was to move to a fresher climate. Uh, well, later that year, she traveled to Wisconsin where her father was the lighthouse keeper. And when she arrived, she found out her father was in poor health and she was appointed the keeper of the North Point Lighthouse. Now, uh, she wasn't really, uh, her she was doing the work for her father because her father didn't want to lose his job. So she basically took over for him until she was uh, became appointed as a lighthouse keeper. They realized that she was doing the, a good, a, a nice enough job and, and they hired her on, on the U.S. Lighthouse Service. Now, the U.S. Lighthouse Service was the original service for lighthouse keepers. Uh, it was a federal job. Um, you would have inspectors come uh, on occasion to see how well you were maintaining the lighthouse. Um, a lot of lighthouse keepers lost their job because they couldn't maintain the lighthouse, the grounds. Uh, they weren't making sure the light was uh, properly lit. Again, if that light's not lit, but you're putting a lot of ships in danger. So you had to make sure that, you know, it was, you had to do your job. Uh, when Georgia was our keeper here, um, she would have to, tend that light again every night. She would get the oil, bring it up to the lighthouse tower in the lantern room. And she would have to replenish that light every four hours from dusk till dawn every day. Uh, that was her duty. And the, the light only, the oil was only, there was only so much oil to burn for four hours. So she would have to go up and down those stairs every four hours from dusk till dawn every day. We estimated the time she lived there, she climbed those stairs 63,800 times. Now I like to tell people that she probably invented step aerobics. <laughs> uh, and uh, the fact that she was uh, recovering from tuberculosis was just an amazing story. Um, Georgia, uh, Georgia's son, Albert, who you see in the photograph here, he was born at the 1855 house. Um, and when she, and she was our first keeper uh, at the 1888 house. 
and uh, she was our longest serving keeper until 1907. Uh, her son Albert again was born in the uh, 1855 house and was born and was raised in the, the the current house. Her two grandsons were both born and raised at uh, the North Point Lighthouse. Um, and uh, another interesting story about Georgia: she only spent three nights away from the lighthouse the whole time she lived there. When she retired in 1921, um, I'm sorry, 1911. Uh, when she retired in 1911, she moved. Uh, probably about maybe about a mile away, uh, maybe less than a mile away. And she died in 1921. Uh, so just an incredible woman. Um, she also uh, had a, played a part in the, she would rescue uh, sailors that or seamen that would get stranded uh, out on the lake. Uh, there would be, there's a son of a sandbar off of North Point And she would, uh, a lot of times these small sailing ships or larger ones would run aground and she would go down uh, to the dock, get in the rowboat and row out and get the uh, the sailors and bring them back to shore. Um, one thing that she was very involved in, a disaster she was part of was what was called the Great Crib Disaster of 1893. I don't know if some of you folks uh, have lived in Milwaukee a long time, remember the what was called Love Rock. Uh, it was right off of Bradford Beach. Uh, that was originally uh, a uh, there was a there was a crib, uh, and on top of that crib, that structure, there was a three-story uh, building, uh, and they were digging a uh, a, f a fresh water pipeline from uh, the shore out about a thousand yards or so, maybe three thousand yards out into the lake, and they were about 160 feet below the lake, uh, and they were mining uh, mining that tunnel, uh, putting in the pipe. Uh, the night of April 12th, 1893, a large storm blew up on the lake. Uh, there was 15 miners living on that site in that crib. The storm blew up. They went down into the into the tunnels. There was water locks, air lo air locks in the in the tunnel, and they locked themselves in uh, for the night, uh, riding out the storm. Well, what they didn't know was during the night the three-story structure with the pumps and the cranes on it was completely washed off of the crib base. And uh, by morning, uh, their air was running out. So uh, they opened up the airtight hatches and the water came pouring in and drowned all but three of them. Uh, three of them made it to the top. Uh, two died at the top. There was only one survivor. Uh, when Georgia got up in that morning, that morning, uh, she would went up and looked out the window uh, of the tower, saw that the crib was gone or the, the structures were gone. She ran down and went to the nearest telephone, which is at the old Protestant home a few blocks away, telephoned the lighthouse, the life-saving crew, uh, which was located on Jones Island. Um, they then tried to get a lifeboat uh, out there uh, by towing it by horses. The axle broke, so they decided to try to get a tugboat out there. So a tugboat left from Jones Island and towed a lifeboat out to the site and they only rescued one person. So it was a, it was quite a disaster. It was, uh, you know, a lot of the families of these miners uh, watched their husbands and sons uh, perish out there from the shoreline. One of George's many tasks during the day was to keep a ledger um, of what she did. Now there was two um, ledgers that she filled out. One was the daily expenditures. She had to record what time the light was lit, what time it was extinguished, how long it burned, uh, how much oil was consumed, and what the weather was every day. Uh, and also, she'd also have to record what was uh, uh, a, and this is the, is the ledger here, it's called the record of passing vessels. She had to record not only how many ships, but what types of ships, barks, brigs, schooners, sloops, and steamers. Uh, and, and then I'm going to record the weather again. So uh, why did she have to do this? Well, we think that maybe it was for commerce purposes to see how many ships came into the port. Uh, it also was probably, uh, it was a record for if a ship was coming from, let's say, Port Washington to Milwaukee, uh, and it didn't show up, uh, they would go to her ledger and say, well, you know, it was a schooner. And she, it was, you know, well, she said I, there was only two schooners. Well, there should have been three schooners. Uh, so they then they would 
they could work their way backwards and see you know, where the ship would, had, it had floundered or, or sunk. But um, on this, in this ledger here, uh, there was one day in September of 18, I believe it was 1870, in the 1870s sometime, uh, there was over 158 ships past the lighthouse, uh, which is amazing. Again, that was the freeway in those days. Uh, you didn't have trains and, tr and trucks and cars. You had uh, ship ships and everything was hauled by ships, uh, again, commerce and passengers. So it was a it was a pretty busy waterway that uh, we have out out on our shore out on our shore. Um, 1893, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Olmsted showed up. Now, uh, Frederick Olmsted uh, was the one that designed Central Park in New York City. Uh, in 1893, he was hired to be the landscape architect for the uh, Columbian Exhibition of 1893, known as the White City. Uh, while he was down there, he ran into a gentleman by the name of Christian Wall, who was from Milwaukee and owned businesses down in Chicago. Mr. Wall talked Mr. Olmsted into coming up to Milwaukee and designed some parks. So he came up and he designed Lake Park, Riverside Park, and Washington Park, our first zoo. Mr. Olmsted took a liking to Lake Park, uh, and uh, he called it the jewel. Uh, uh, well, he called the lighthouse the jewel of Lake Park. Uh, he the two lion bridges sort of are bookend the lighthouse. So it became uh, not only a functioning lighthouse for navigation, but it also became a tourist attraction. Uh, when Georgia lived there, uh, she was a very avid gardener. So she planted beautiful uh, flowers out in front of the lighthouse and she would let people picnic on the front lawn of the lighthouse. And at, on occasion, she would let them climb the tower um, and uh, take a look at, at the lake and things. So it was a, a beautiful, uh, a beautiful park. On, and it, it drew a lot of uh, a lot of people to it. Again, the fact that there was a lighthouse there. Uh, I also mentioned the statue of General Wolcott. Um, he's the gentleman on the horse that's just north of the lighthouse. The reason that statue is there is because General Wolcott used to like like to ride his horse in that park. And after he died, his wife dedicated a statue in his memory. Uh, Christian Wall had a statue. Uh, that was located at the uh, on the east end of the lighthouse, uh, right across the bike path. Um, uh, uh, it was what was called an outlook uh, or vista. Uh, there was later a cannon was put there, uh, a Civil War coastal cannon. Uh, like like after World War II, a lot of uh, VFW posts and parks got cannons and tanks. Well, after the Civil War, they had a surplus of cannons, so they they placed them in a lot of parks. And that cannon was there, uh, we think, until around the start of the Second World War when it was used to melt it down for the war efforts. Um, but uh, that then that there's a road. Now, today there's a bike path, but there was a road in front of the lighthouse uh, up until 1964. They closed it in 64 because the bridges got too frail, so they uh, turned them into bike paths years later. Well, when Mr. Olmsted uh, designed the park, well, what's the first thing you do? You plant trees. Well, he planted all these trees. And in fact, uh, when Christian Wall would help him plant the trees, uh, every time they planted a mature tree, a lot, a lot of times they planted mature trees, uh, Mr. Uh, Wall would uh, uh, toast with a glass of champagne for all the trees that they they planted the mature trees they planted in Lake Park. So I, I always tell people there's probably a lot of champagne bottles laying around Lake Park. But as the trees grew, they eventually obscured the lighthouse. Um, so by about 1910, the lighthouse, you couldn't see it from the lake anymore. So they turned off the light and they brought in a light ship. Uh, and this is a photograph of the light ship, the light ship Milwaukee. It was placed out about three miles out into the bay. And uh, again, it was a stationary, it was anchored out there. Uh, but it wasn't very effective. Again, it wasn't that tall. Uh, ships couldn't see it from any great distance. And uh, the uh, if the fog rolled in, you couldn't see it at all. Um, now, you can't see a lighthouse when the fog rolls in. That's why they had fog bells. The fog bell was located down at the uh, old Pierhead Light, which is just south of Summerfest. And today, there's a, it's a red lighthouse. Uh, that, was the, that was built in 1897. Uh, and uh, that's where the fog bell was located. Uh, so a fog bell also has a characteristic. So if you're in the fog, 
out on a ship in the bay and you hear a fog bell ringing, well, you don't know where you are. So uh, fog bells had a characteristic ring. So they would be like ding, ding, ding. So you knew the cadence of the lighthouse bell. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, of the, um, the fog bell. So you, again, knew where you were. So again, by... 1911, 1912, Mariners said, you know, we, we got we to gotta fix this. We, this. This thing isn't going to work. So what they did was start over at North Point and build a, a different lighthouse. Now, this photograph here is, is kind of a rare photograph. I found this a number of years ago. Uh, I was lucky enough to find it and, and purchase it online. It shows two lighthouses there. Well, this one here is a wooden lighthouse. They built a temporary wooden lighthouse uh, on the grounds and they used it, they took the light from the old cast iron 1880 house and put it in this house until they got the new tower built. So again, this is a very in interesting and rare photograph of how they, they kept the light burning while they, they were restoring the new lighthouse. So this is uh, the new lighthouse uh, in 18, uh, 1912. Uh, what they did, was they dismantled the bolted cast iron lighthouse. And they built a, they added a riveted steel addition to it and they put the original back on top of it again. Now the new, the unique thing about, we can say about Milwaukee's North Point Lighthouse is it's the, it's the only lighthouse in the country built out of three lighthouses, 1912, 1888, and this is the lantern room from the 1855 lighthouse. Let me just talk a little bit about lighthouse keepers. Uh, again, they were uh, uh, the U.S. Lighthouse Service uh, hired the lighthouse keepers, and I'm wearing a little pin here. This was the, the official lighthouse keepers pin. Uh, some of the lighthouse keepers that we had um, in Milwaukee were, um, again, there were several of them uh, that were that lived at the lighthouse. Um, Daniel Kellogg Green uh, again was. He, I'm sorry, Georgia Stebbins uh, was our first lighthouse keeper. Um, this is Martin Knudsen. He was uh, a lighthouse keeper uh, in, in Wisconsin, and he retired from, from um, he retired from the service in Milwaukee at North Point Lighthouse. He was born uh, in Norway. He he grew up on Washington Island. Uh, became a keeper at several lighthouses on Washington Island. Uh, was involved in very uh, quite a few shipwreck uh, rescues. Um, he was down in Racine, and then he came up to uh, Milwaukee where he retired. His brother was also a lighthouse keeper. Now, some of the lighthouse keepers in Milwaukee also served at the Breakwater Light out on in, in, in the Bay of Milwaukee, and they also served at the Pierhead Light. So you had a kind of rotation of, of lighthouse keepers. This is Reynold Johnson. He was um, uh, retired from North Point Lighthouse. Uh, he was the last... Uh, lighthouse keeper that worked at the lighthouse uh, in the U.S. Lighthouse Service. By 1938, uh, all the lighthouses were automated, so there was no, really no need for lighthouse keepers. So in 1938, the U.S. Coast Guard took over from the U.S. Lighthouse Service, and they manned all the lighthouses and Coast Guard stations uh, on the Great Lakes. Um, this gentleman here, his name is Roger Erdman. Uh, he was in the Coast Guard. Uh, Roger Erdman is my uncle, or was my uncle. Uh, and uh, he was stationed at the North Point Lighthouse from 1958 until 1962. So he was transferred here from Woods Hole, Massachusetts in 1958. Previous to that, in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, he was the, he rescued the captain and crew of the Andrea Doria, which sank in 1957 out of, off of uh, Woods Hole, Massachusetts. He was also involved in the rescue of two ships that sank in 1952 off of Nantucket. Uh, there was a book and movie called The Finest Hours, uh, he helped rescue the crew of the Fort Mercer, one of the tankers that sank and broke in two uh, back in then. Uh, Roger sir, was from Port Washington, Wisconsin. Uh, he joined the Coast Guard in uh, 19, I believe it was like 1939 or 1940. And uh, he was uh, stationed in the Pacific during the Second World War. He was uh uh, on a LST, uh, his LST number 202 put the first tanks and Marines on Guam during the Pacific War. Um, he stayed in the Coast Guard uh, after the war. And um, again, when he moved to Milwaukee here, he was in charge of 
uh, the, all the lighthouses and Coast Guard stations on Lake Michigan. Uh, and these offices were down on the end of Greenfield Avenue. That's where the, uh, the lighthouse uh, service and the Coast Guard base was. Um, so he had four kids, my cousin. So I used to play there when I was a child. I was in kindergarten, but I remember going to the lighthouse with my mother and my sister and spending the day there with my cousins. And um, I came, from, I come from a quite a large family of 26 first cousins on my mother's side. And uh, so we would hold all our 4th of July parties and our rally rallies and birthday parties out at the lighthouse. So I, I know Lake Park like the back of my hand right now because I've played on there so many times, but it was really nice to uh, have that opportunity. And that's sort of what got me connected with the North Point Lighthouse uh, when it opened up again, when it was restored. Um, the lighthouse was in operation until 1992 uh, when the lighthouse, the Coast Guard turned the light out because uh, of GPS and the RAN, there was, wasn't really any need for lighthouses uh, anymore. So uh, the lighthouse was, was boarded up and given to the, the county. Uh, it stood abandoned for a number of years. And then uh, a group of people uh, formed uh, the North Point Lighthouse Friends and, uh, and got the raised the money uh, and the funds, and the grants to restore the lighthouse uh, to uh, it's close to its original condition as possible because uh, it just, you know, it was such a beautiful icon. It was a shame to see it just fall into disrepair. Um, I like to call it polishing the jewel. You can see in this picture right here, uh, all the work that they had to do. They had to do a lot of lead abatement, uh, asbestos, not too much asbestos, but a lot of lead abatement because the tower has been painted with lead paint for so many years. And there was a lot of oil in the, in the ground from the oil house and things like that. But uh, through the help of the North Point Lighthouse friends and, and wonderful donations and, and donors and volunteers, uh, the lighthouse is restored uh, and opened uh, as a museum in 2007. Um, the, um, This is kind of an interesting uh, little story. I was giving tours at the lighthouse a few years ago and uh, people would come in for tours. And this woman came in, she was from Germany and uh, I gave her a tour and I was, I was talking all about the lighthouse and she climbed to the top of the tower. And um, she, when she came down, she called me over and she said, I have something for you. And she, pulled out this postcard out of her purse. And uh, it was a postcard that her great, great grandmother had sent, who, who great, great grandmother who had come from Germany to visit Milwaukee in 1902. She wrote this little post, she found a postcard of, of Lake Park, which happened to have the lighthouse in it. And she wrote a note uh, to back to Germany. And uh, the postcard went back to Germany. And uh, about a hundred years later or more, uh, this woman found this, had this card in her possessions. It was her great, great grandmother's items and things. And she brought the card back to, uh, to Milwaukee. And I, I just thought I was very touched by that. And, and that's a lot of stories that uh, giving tours at the lighthouse. Again, uh, it's a museum, it's a functioning museum. Uh, you can climb the tower. It's a great, uh, great view of Milwaukee and the lake. Uh, there's a lot of history about uh, shipwrecks and things in, uh, in the area and uh, a lot of history about talks about immigrants and things so it's a it's a nice really a great experience the lighthouse right now has been closed since uh due to covid it's been closed since march and they're trying to uh, get it open again this summer so uh kind of watch their website and see if they you know when the if and when they can open again because uh, it's just a wonderful place to visit um oh I, by the way i asked the woman i said can i have the card she says no you can't have the card <laughs> But I said, well, you said you have something for me. She said, well, I have something to show you. But she took the card back to Germany with her. So, um, you know, it was kind of a nice, nice experience. Shipwrecks, uh, I can just touch on those a little bit. Um, uh, uh, there's over 2,000 shipwrecks on the Great Lakes, and like Lake Michigan, almost 20,000 on the Great Lakes combined. Um, it's, it's a very volatile, dangerous body of water. Uh, the White Hurricane of 1912 uh, 
sank uh, 19 ships, 40 were destroyed and 250 lives are lost. So it's it's a really, uh, it's a tough lake and, and that's why lighthouses are needed. Uh, so a uh, couple things and I'll just finish up and take some questions if you have any. Uh, just a little tidbits about uh, lighthouses. Whale oil was, was used uh, originally. Uh, it was a source with the parabolic, parabolic reflectors. It was introduced around 1810. Cozy oil, which was pressed from wild cabbages, replaced whale oil, whale oil in the 1850s, but farmers' lack of interest in growing this caused the service to switch to lard oil in the mid-1850s. Kerosene started replacing lard oil in the 1870s, and the service was finally totally converted by the late 18, 1880s. Electricity started to replace kerosene around the turn of the century. Coal gas was used in some lighthouses before they converted to electricity. So I hope I gave you folks a, a little history about lighthouses and again, they're beacons of history and uh, they, they have a lot of stories to tell and they've welcomed a lot of people. A lot of our ancestors were welcomed. The first thing they saw when they came to Milwaukee was North Point Lighthouse. So John, I'll turn it over to you. All right, well, wonderful job, Mark. I did just the worst job of uh, giving you an introduction before. Um, so it, Mark uh, is, is an expert on this uh, so much that he was the curator for a long time at North Point Lighthouse um, and uh, now is the board president of All Hands Boat Works. So I just want to make sure that people knew that your, what your association with North Point Lighthouse right. um, uh, was. Uh, we did get some questions in already that are just great. So I'm just going to find those real quick. So one okay. question I had and then Don has one similar. So I'll kind of piggyback on Don here is... Okay is the next lighthouse south of North Point in Racine. And so what are kind of the area lighthouses? Maybe if you so, can paint so you that got, landscape. I'll kind of go down the down the line as well. Starting from the north, you've got um, uh, Sheboygan, Manitowoc. Um, uh, let's see, there's, I'm, I'm forgetting some of them here. I'm drawing a blank, but you get Port Washington. And now Port Washington's Lighthouse is also a little museum, and uh, they're open for tours. I mean, again, I, I can't say much with, with COVID. Uh, I don't know what their what their plans are for this coming year, but uh, it's a great little lighthouse. It's built up on a hill, and uh, they they got a really wonderful little museum there. Uh, so you got then you've got Milwaukee, and in Milwaukee you've got the North Point Lighthouse, and you've got the Pierhead Light, uh, which is right at just the south end of Summerfest. And then you've also have the breakwater light, which is um, is out on the out on the breakwater. Uh, to the south of us is the Racine or Wind Point light. Um, and on a really nice clear night, uh, you can see the, the light from uh, Racine from the top of the tower of North Point. Uh, and then from down from there, you've got Kenosha. Now the Wind Point lighthouse, um, again, had been open for uh, tours a couple times a month, you could climb the tower. On that tower, you could go actually outside of the lantern room and walk around what was called the widow's walk or the little uh, railing outside the, uh, the lighthouse. And then Kenosha Lighthouse uh, Museum is really nice. They got a great, uh, a great little lighthouse you can take tours of. Again, you'd have to look them up on the website to see when their hours of operation are. So and then you just kind of work your way down the coast. Sure, sure. Um our uh, assistant archivist I ha I, when steve asked a question i am like contractually obligated to ask it um of our speakers uh but he heard that lighthouse tenders maintained an informal library service for different lighthouses around the great lakes is that true? yes there was a um a traveling library and there's a, a, a traveling library that came from the milwaukee county historical society thank you very much uh to the lighthouse the north point lighthouse and uh it contains uh, a lot of books. Now, a lot of lighthouses uh, are in remote areas or on islands. So uh, people had no access to any kind of, you know, they, they were stuck on this island for a while. So these lighthouse tenders, the ships that would bring all the supplies also brought a box of books for people to read. And I like to call it the first Kindle or the first Nook. Um, so you would sign your name on the box and, and there were several of these boxes that rotated the lake. So every time the ship came around, you put your name on a box and they would drop off a box for a period of time. Uh, some of these uh, boxes had uh, children's books in them because uh, some of the children living on these light at these lighthouses were remote, uh, were homeschooled. So it gave them something for, to do. Um, and there's also uh, where uh, uh, there was two Bibles, the Protestant and the Catholic Bibles were also in those boxes. Wow, really interesting stuff. Um... I think we got one more question, and then uh, then we'll we'll adjourn for this evening. And that does the uh, 
Does the North Point Museum ever light the beacon anymore? No, the, 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 the last light, the Fresnel lens is in the gallery um, and, and it's in, in a case on the, in the gallery, but no, the, the North Point Lighthouse is, is not, does not, uh, is not illuminated anymore. And no plans to LED no. up there? And no, <laughs> no, no, because the, the beacons are, uh, there's, there's beacons out on the breakwater and again, GPS and Loran, uh, there really isn't no, is no need for it. That makes sense. Well, Mark, thanks so much for your time and knowledge tonight. Um, I, I'm sure when you heard that the historical society was putting this exhibit together, you got really excited. It's yes. topic, a topic that's very uh, near, near and dear to you. Yes. Uh, yeah. But uh, but uh, we're we're glad you enjoyed the exhibit. We hope that everybody else has a chance to come out. Um, historical society, and uh, uh, you can see it. Uh, nor our normal business hours are at MilwaukeeHistory.net, um, and it's Milwaukee where the waters meet. Um, so until until we meet again uh, next week, we're doing. Um, let me pop that uh, talk up for next week. Is uh, for the love of water, a water conservation panel discussion event uh, with some people uh, doing water conservation in the Milwaukee area. Uh, so that's next week, same place, same time. So if you're here, you can be there too. Uh, we hope you uh, join us again. And Mark, thanks so much. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. Take care. We'll Thanks, see you everybody. Again. Be safe.